the session is being recorded. And so remaining in the meeting will uh, be understood to be your consent to be recorded. And finally, I will thank you in advance um, for your patience with any technical difficulties that may arise. We've, we've gotten a little bit of practice with Zoom, but there's, um, there's always something new and exciting to be dealt with technologically. Um, so we can go to the next slide, Siobhan. Um, my name is Allison Cosma, um, and I'm the, the SEPS um, Technical Specialist for Inclusion. Um, SEP, the SEPS Consortium, for those of you who are not familiar, is comprised of three core partners, the National Democratic Institute, um, the International Federation for Electoral Systems, and um, the, the International Republican Institute, of whom the, the panelists are representing today. We also have a number of associate partners, some of whom um, we're pleased to have join us in the call today. And we're currently in the process of implementing USAID's uh, Global Elections and Political Transitions um, Leader with Associate Award. And one of the really important things of that mechanism is the cross-cutting priority that focuses on the meaningful integration of women and other marginalized populations, namely uh, youth, people with disabilities, LGBTI individuals, ethnic and religious minorities, and indigenous peoples into all areas of DRG programming in a way that is inclusive, intersectional, and gender responsive. So that means that that is something that we're considering in a priority way, regardless of what the technical area that we're working in or regardless of the, the country or regional context in which we're working. Um, and so then that brings us to our conversation today, because we're now thinking about how do we look at DRG responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in a way that's inclusive and intersectional, and namely gender responsive. Next. So we, we all know, I think by now, um, that in fact there is a disproportionate impact um, of COVID-19 on populations that are already marginalized. On an almost daily basis, there is a meeting or a webinar or um, an article that comes out talking about just this issue. Um, so I will not belabor the, the particular points, but we know that because of existing inequalities and discrimination, um, there are um, amplified and disproportionate impacts now in terms of increased care work, increased unemployment, violence, risk of um, infection, in addition to the fact that now we see closing public spaces, we see the suspensions of, of democratic laws and policies, and a sort of an increase in opportunistic authoritarianism. All of that means that at this point in, in which we are right now in this pandemic, we risk backsliding and losing a lot of the, the progress and the, the hard-earned gains, particularly in terms of the participation of marginalized communities in public life. At the same time, the good news is that there are some opportunities right now. We know that many marginalized communities, in particular women, are leading the charge and are leaders within their communities and their families and are many of the frontline responders and caregivers. They have a specific knowledge about how to better prepare for these sort of crisis situations and how to respond more effectively. Um, and, and this crisis, as do many other types of crises, crises, which Caroline will talk more about, actually provide a unique um, opportunity, window of opportunity for some real social and political transformation. And so the question here today is how do we take steps to ensure that an inclusive and intersectional gender lens is integrated into DRG responses to COVID-19 in order to better ensure that the overall response is more effective and in order to use this opportunity to strengthen the political participation of marginalized groups and, and ultimately to create more inclusive and more resilient democracy and governance institutions and processes. And we are very pleased um, today to have one of our former SEPS colleagues, Michelle Beckering, now of USAID, um, to provide the really high level um, view for us and to give a perspective from USAID on how they're thinking about these issues as they're crafting their responses to, to the pandemic. Um, I will not um, go into a lengthy um, bio or give you too much information about Michelle's illustrious background, but I do wanna give you a few highlights for those of you who may not be familiar. Um, Michelle's currently serving as the Assistant Administrator of the Bureau for Economic Growth, Education, and environment at USAID. 
where she leads the Bureau in developing innovative and sustainable solutions across 12 technical areas to accelerate USAID's impact in reaching its development outcomes. Uh, Michelle's formerly served as the agency's senior coordinator for gender equality and women's empowerment, where among other achievements, she supported the development of the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative. Prior to joining USAID, Ms. Beckering spent a number of years at IRI, where she led global democracy rights and governance initiatives with a specific focus on parliamentary and political party strengthening and the political inclusion of women and youth. So I'm now happy to turn it over to Michelle. Great, thank you so much, Allison. And what a pleasure uh, to be connected to all of you here today. Um, I actually feel like this is a homecoming. As Allison mentioned, um, I'm a proud IRI alum, uh, and also, of course, was a member of both the SEPS family as well as the National Endowment for Democracy family. And so I know a lot of the organizations uh, that I worked with um, are on this call today, and it's, it's just really a pleasure. So with that, I want to start by saying um, on behalf of myself and USAID, my thoughts and concerns uh, truly are with you, with your loved ones, your organizations, and of course, your implementing partners who are really on the front lines across the world as we're all working together to face this global pandemic. And so, you know, when Valerie reached out to me um, about this event, I right away was like, absolutely, I um, would love to participate because this is so timely. The topic you're discussing uh, is always timely, but never more so than we are really facing this pandemic. And so I'm assuming, um, having looked at some of the participant lists, um, that most of us on this call, uh, maybe some more new, but most of us who might be considered old hands by now, um, have been focusing on women's empowerment equality uh, for a very long time. And we all know, as Allison um, outlined in her beginning remarks, we recognize that the pandemic, frankly, has exposed, it's exasperated, uh, the, the existing, excuse me, gender inequality equities and equalities we were already seeing in societies. And our concern is frankly that it will threaten to reverse uh, that recent progress we've made towards gender equality and women's empowerment. And so I know you're going to get a, a little bit deeper uh, later into this call in, you know, looking at what some of the specific uh, issues are, but I do want to highlight them and, and kind of talk about them from my perch at USAID. Um, so first and foremost, as, as um, Allison outlined, I oversee a broad uh, bureau which looks at development issues from many different technical angles. And so we're constantly looking at, you know, what are implications um, specifically when it comes to COVID-19 on trade, on education, uh, on economic growth and poverty, and of course on gender equality and women's empowerment. And these are things that concern us because anytime we're looking at doing any interventions uh, to either um, prevent or respond to development challenges or humanitarian uh, challenges, we really have to look at all the different factors that go into this to make sure we can, frankly, prescribe solutions that are going to work. And um, so, uh, not to get into you know detail that you all know but the things that have really concerned us when we're looking at our response are several of these factors the first we already recognize that women make up about 70 percent of all healthcare workers so as we look at this pandemic we recognize um, that they are more likely therefore than men to be serving in frontline positions as either nurses as midwives um, or community health workers we also recognize that even before the crisis came along, women often shouldered a disproportionate burden of what we call unpaid uh, care, um, home care, you know, being the primary caregivers for children, for the elderly. And now, like many of us on this call, uh, those women now have an added responsibility of caring for children who are out of school, um, of homeschooling them, and also for taking care of family members who may be ill. So these are things that, that we recognize and we have to address. Um, this morning, I was having a conversation, a strategy session with my economic uh, policy group and my trade and regulatory reform group. And one of the things we also recognize is 
we have to remember that COVID-19 is, is coming at us in various forms, right? We have the very obvious first, what we call first order impact, right? The devastating toll it's taking on health. But what we also recognize that going right in tangent with that is second order impacts. So the things that we're discussing is when you already have strapped healthcare systems in the developing world, when you already have schools that struggle with providing quality education, uh, when you look at poverty, we are seeing these issues now exasperated. And we're really concerned about not only the immediate impact, but really long-term uh, impact in how we're going to deal with that. So today, the stat that came uh, to us when we did our analysis is 1.5 1.58 billion children are out of school around the world. Before the crisis, we already recognized the disproportionate amount of girls that were out of school. And so things that my team and uh, myself are talking about is, what does this look like when the pandemic ends? Uh, when maybe families are more impoverished than ever? You know, what will this look like for girls going back to school? So these are, in everything we do, there is an engendered aspect because we have to think about those disproportionate effects. And then finally, um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about um, the, the area of gender-based violence. We remain diligent in monitoring the rise of GBV. We recognize, as you all know very well, that there's often a correlation between uh, the rise in GBV and times of conflict and crisis. And we also recognize we're in unprecedented times when every region of the world is being affected at the same time by these crisis, this crisis. And so we remain very concerned about not only GBV, but the possible inability um, of emergency um, response, of medical response, police and justice services, um, and all really the social safety nets, uh, as well as treatment um, that would be needed by um, victims of abuse. So these are things that we're really concerned about. And then, as, as I've mentioned, you know, we know this isn't just a health and economic crisis. We are also really diligently looking at the democratic uh, rights and governance aspect of this. Of course, that's my background, and it's something I understand is so fundamental to all of our work across the, the world. And it's really how USAID approaches um, our programming. We're looking right now and seeing, as you all are, at how state and other malign uh, state or malign actors um, are responding to the pandemic, and and we unfortunately are seeing that in some areas, where there are rising fundamental threats to democratic principles, to human rights, and to fundamental freedoms. So we recognize that alongside our health interventions, you know, we uh, as the U.S. government, as USAID, but also you, our partners who are in the field, you know, working uh, side by side um, with governments, with decision makers, we need to continue to encourage them, governments, political actors, civil society, media, to promote and uphold democratic principles. This is going to be crucial um, as we seek to implement our, our crisis response. I also want to, to end on this point. Um, you know, responding to the pandemic, I think, has really underscored and highlighted in a new light the critical importance of women's political and civic leadership. Uh, this, of course, is something I hold very dear. We have long advocated, and I know I've worked with Caroline and Allison and uh, Valerie for years, and also our IFAS colleagues on this issue, because, you know, for decades we've been saying, you cannot successfully meet challenges, and, and specifically, I would say this aligns with the objectives of the U.S. Uh, strategy on women, peace, and security, when we've long recognized that the reason that so many of our remediation processes, our reconciliation processes, have failed is because they don't take into account all of the voices. All of the stakeholders who have been affected, affected and who best know what sort of response or solution they have to their own one grievances or two problems. And so I would say this is only more highlighting the need that we 
absolutely need to have more women in these leadership positions, making sure that the specific issues facing women, facing girls uh, in this time of pandemic are addressed. And as you know, if you look at the stats across the world, too many women are in these decision-making positions. So I wanna urge you, and specifically today as you have this conversation, but also beyond um, that we really all, all of us, every organization participating today, we need to explicitly ensure that we are building mechanisms for consultation with women. We need to specifically include those um, from vulnerable and marginalized groups, and we need to understand what exactly in their context is the barrier to their specific participation and then work together to develop the the best approach or intervention to not only reach them but to ensure they meet those leadership goals we must identify program adaptations we may need to look at additional resources we really need to look at what the best interventions are not only now during the crisis but after um, i really you know it, it does not it is not lost on me that we find ourselves in, in a really interesting situation where, again, every region of the world is facing this crisis at the same time. And so we are able to actually start developing an analyses and looking at data of how this affected women in every region of the world. And I think that's going to be so crucial for us as we go forward. So again, I ask you to continue to work to support your partners in the field. Thank you for your work, but continue to work with our government institutions, our CSOs, the political parties, everyone who are stakeholders and helping us make sure that more women's voices are involved in these processes. And finally, we must all remember in our work, we have got to take care to ensure that our programs do no harm. And this is a mandate and a mission of USAID that we do no harm. We need to ensure that we're minimizing risks to groups um, which are at increased risk of discrimination, of violence, of either re-traumatization or trauma uh, in the first effect, further stigmat stigmatization, and of course, negative health or economic outcomes. This is so important. I'm proud of the leadership internationally of USAID in these efforts, but I'm even more proud to acknowledge um, the on the ground work that all of you, specifically our SEPS partners, but all of you on this call are doing to make this a reality. So with that, I wanna thank you again for your efforts. Thank you for your collaboration with USAID. Thank you for being willing to be part of the conversation and also the solution. I just know that together we're going to ensure that all of our societies are more resilient to future crises. So with that, um, let me pause and I will hand the floor back over to Allison. Thank you, Michelle, for um, the sort of that broad overview. I think it's really, um, it's, it's helpful for us to hear about, because, because this is such a complex issue um, and it impacts virtually every aspect of, of life, every technical sphere, it's, it's helpful to hear about how USAID is thinking about this in a, in a comprehensive way and, and across the, the different sort of silos within the agency. And I think you did a really great job of sort of, of setting up the conversation and um, hitting on some of the, the, key, the key points and the key areas that the, the subsequent panelists are, are going to speak on. Um, and so I thank you for being here with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to Caroline now, who's going to sort of pull back and talk about some of the opportunities, um, the impacts and opportunities that exist when we talk about shocks to the, the political system. Caroline? Great, thank you so much, Allison and Michelle. It's great to be here with, um, yeah, old activist friends that have been working on this with uh, NDI for a long time. So my name is Caroline Hubbard. I'm the Deputy Director for Gender, Women, and Democracy at the National Democratic Institute. Shocks to politics, economies, and societies have long-term threats to and opportunities for gender equality and the inclusion of all marginalized populations. Importantly, shocks provide openings to transform the broader political, legal, and social barriers to a more inclusive kind of politics. These moments of flux offer opportunities to sh shift unequal power relations in ways that can strengthen democracy and increase resilience. 
In turn, this can improve the governance response to future shocks, ensuring more effective resolutions to or recovery from crisis. Next slide. There are three types of reoccurring shocks that merit attention. Health pandemics, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic, conflict and violence and war, and natural disasters. Each of these share similarities as shocks, but will have differential impacts on women and girls relative to men and boys, as well as other marginalized populations, including people with disabilities or religious minorities. To the extent that the international development sector views the cause, trajectory, and resolution and recovery from these crises through a democratic governance lens, responses to them must be delivered with the equal and active voice and agency of all citizens in order to be effective. Next slide. What we know is that as shocks such as these occur, the political space for all actors, which is highly unlikely to have been 100% inclusive to begin with, shrinks. Presenting democracy programs with a changed political and governance, governance landscape. This is often described in the research as the whole political system moving from a more cons consultative mode of operation to command and control. This changed landscape will require adapting programming, developing new programming, or engaging in advocacy, either as part of the short term response to the crisis or because the crisis has changed the medium to long term context. The shrinking space interacts with pre-existing inequalities rooted in gender norms and other social cleavages to have a differentially negative impact on women and all marginalized populations. These will include a further loss of their voice and agency in political and decision-making processes, as well as physical restrictions and information gaps at a time when inclusive governance is an imperative for succeeding to address the shock. Next slide. In particular for women, there is also a tendency to revert to less progressive gender norms for both political and sociocultural reasons. The result of such social regression can have a compounded impact on women with additional marginalized identities, such as women with disabilities. This image on the slide shows what happens in four core areas during a shock. Sociocultural norms. Shocks, as I mentioned, tend to lead to a return to regressive regression in rights and the withdrawing or withholding of rights that have been gained such as access to education or public leadership roles. This will undermine women's autonomy and their engagement in decision-making. And in the physical space, increased insecurity and forced isolation prevent women from physically leaving their homes to participate in politics. And they also increase the likelihood of violence against women's bodies inside the home when they try and lead and participate in advocacy and leadership. And voice. The changes in political institutions and processes during a crisis have a profound impact on women's political participation. As political power is consolidated under a single, almost always male leader or regime, opportunities for democratic dissent or competition from outside actors or opposing parties also decrease. This effectively cuts off the primary entry point for women's voices which is largely via civil society or formal political processes that have gender equality mechanisms built into them, such as gender quotas. And then the lack of access to accurate, relevant, and timely information is a key threat to women's ability to perform leadership roles in these times of crisis as well. Next slide. So as interventions adapt and formulate strategies in the context of the shrinking political landscape caused by shocks, in particular caused by COVID-19 at this point in time, to ensure that gender equality and inclusion are central to each phase of the response to the shock, there are three key questions to be answered or rather to be asked. The first question should be, how has the shrinking political space differentially impacted the ability of women and other marginalized populations to participate in politics. For example, what does it mean for women's participation in Kenya that the response to the crisis has been highly militarized and violent? At the National Democratic Institute, one thing that we've started to do immediately is send surveys out to our country programs to assess the impact of the shock. And we've recently added specific questions about gender-based violence. Is there a perception of an increase in violence? Is there any information that shows that there is an actual increase in violence? And what we've learned in, in recent uh, results from that survey is that there is an increase in violence and perception of an increase in violence in most of our country offices. 
The second question that should be asked is, what are the most urgent and important areas to address through our adapted or reformulated programming to ensure that women and other marginalized groups are not completely excluded or their, or their rights completely reversed? So for example, if there's a separate governing body being created in order to manage the COVID response, how can we potentially leverage pre-existing gender equality mechanisms such as gender quotas to ensure that women are in those decision-making bodies? We know right now that the majority of the decision-making bodies don't have any or have very few women on them. And then the third question, which is really important, is how do we use this time as an opportunity to really transform the pre-existing inequities and to ensure that our response to future shocks is more resilient because we have a more equitable playing field and a more equitable society and because everyone is able to participate in political decision making. These three questions are critical when identifying strategies for maintaining the gains women or other groups have made pre-shock and seizing opportunities for transforming inequalities to ensure resilience to future shocks. Um, I will stop there and pass it on to Valerie Dowling at the International Republican Institute. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Caroline. Um, my name is Valerie Dowling, and I serve as the director of the Women's Democracy Network at the International Republican Institute. I'm very excited to join my SEPS colleagues today to talk about how we build a recovery for everyone by putting gender at the center of our DRG response to COVID-19. As my fellow panelists have shared, the global pandemic has proven that it impacts women in a disproportionate way. Women currently make up over 70% of those working in healthcare and elderly care, which means the majority of workplace risk is falling on women who are more likely to be considered essential workers. We know also that around the world, women make up the majority of the informal sector labor. Women make up 95% of informal employment in South Asia, 89% in Sub-Saharan Africa, and 59% in Latin America and the Caribbean. Whether it's as street vendors, seasonal workers, and domestic workers, women are dis disproportionately affected by the pandemic, social distancing, and other restrictions and overly securitized government responses. Resultant loss of income due to an inability to as actively participate in the informal sector quickly removes any sort of safety net they rely on and makes them and their families more vulnerable to severe economic hardship, exploitation, and violence. In Kenya, for example, the government put into place strict curfews and anyone found outside after hours is detained and quarantined at their own expense. Women are especially vulnerable to and impacted by this, whether they're attempting to vend on the street for as long as possible given shortened hours available, or are running against the clock in order to go grocery shopping for their household. There's also the additional strain of working to adapt to extra education and childcare shifts and responsibilities in the midst of lockdowns around the world. We're seeing domestic violence increased as movement is restricted and economic pressure mounts under lockdown. This can exacerbate already difficult household dynamics. A study by a research consortium that includes John Hopkins University recently projected that 31 million additional cases of gender-based violence could be expected globally if lockdowns last an average of six months. Just to highlight an example of our work, in the first three months of 2020, there were 15,440 cases of violence against women reported across Colombia comprising 76.7% of all registered cases of domestic violence. These numbers have continued to rise across the country. In the first weeks of the lockdown at the end of March, the mayor of Bogota noted that all crime statistics were down except for domestic violence and calls to the police hotline spiked by 225%. We know that women are not only vulnerable to intimate partner violence, but for those in conflict-affected communities, they're also targeted for violence by armed groups. Much like authoritarian governments, paramilitary groups are exploiting the pandemic to meet their goals. As government focus and resources, such as protection units, have pivoted towards addressing the pandemic, and social leaders and activists are forced to shelter in place, they can also become vulnerable. 
There are additional risks for maternal and neonatal health, especially in places where women must travel long distances to reach the nearest hospital. So how can we start to address these challenges and embrace these opportunities to make sure that we build a recovery for everyone with our DRG response? I wanted to share a few practical approaches and examples of how IRI is working through our SEPS programs across the Institute to mainstream gender into our DRG response to COVID-19. We know that any global response to COVID-19 must prioritize women's political participation. Democracy demands that all citizens are represented, especially women. We know that they make up over 50% of the population, which means they need to be at the decision-making table in order to get this response and recovery done right. It's impossible to build a successful plan if women and other marginalized voices are not represented in the process. We must understand the impacts of the pandemic on women and other marginalized populations in order to develop appropriate policy solutions. IRI is currently working with women elected officials at the national and subnational level to train them on crisis communications and planning, which will allow them to be best prepared to play an active role in the response and recovery process. We recently connected women policymakers across Latin America in order to talk about the response to COVID-19 in their own countries and share best practices. It's important that women are represented in these conversations and at the decision-making table. In IRI's SEP Specific Islands program, our teams are looking at the specific impact that the lockdowns have produced on women, especially the economic impact of a devastated tourism industry. To empower women who've been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, IRI is looking at how we can better address these needs and provide women with skills such as entrepreneurship, financial management, business development, and leadership. This will be critical to empowering women in the economic aftermath. As I mentioned earlier, we're seeing the increased demand for support services for women, especially when it comes to increased risk of gender-based violence. We know that travel to shelters can be restricted and simple phone calls to helplines can trigger additional violence. In many countries, we see support services are overwhelmed. There's a 47% increase in calls to Spain's national hotline since the lockdown began. And in Ukraine, there was an 113% spike in UN supported hotlines. In addition, access to vital maternal and neonatal medical care can be limited or non-existent. So one best practice we have is to have elected officials and civil society to work together to make sure that support service delivery is sustained in order to mitigate and respond to the increased incidence of gender-based violence. Women's Democracy Network will also be launching a second iteration of our 10 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence this summer to continue to talk with political parties civil society and government institutions about how they can work together to address GBV in their communities and countries. It's also important, as several people have mentioned, to build in program adaptations, which include high-tech and low-tech engagement to provide more engagement opportunities for citizens, regardless of their access to internet and technology. The last principle I want to share is the most important, as we continue to reinforce the power of good, inclusive governance. We know that inclusive democratic processes are important to give all voices in society access to government decision making in order to better reflect their needs and aspirations, both in policy making and in service delivery. We know that good inclusive governance is crucial for a fair society and a stronger economy and helps to improve the relationship between governments and their citizens. This is especially important as we navigate the short and long term impacts of COVID-19 around the world. As Caroline mentioned previously, we have the opportunity to use the shock to build governments that are even more reflective and representative of the societies they serve. By prioritizing inclusiveness, government adds a dimension to the effectiveness of policymaking processes and outcomes. It allows civil society and the wider public to be more involved in policymaking, regulation, and service delivery. By gathering more information from their citizens about their needs and the impact of policies on them, it'll allow for governments and public policies to be more effective and public services to be more user-friendly and user-driven. 
Um, and as I continue to share just a few final examples, our SEPS programs work to promote good inclusive governance around the world. In Burma, our SEPS program is currently implementing women's leadership training schools under our Strengthening Elections and Political Transition Program to empower more women to be ready to engage at all levels of the political process in advance of upcoming elections. And in our SEPS Tunisia program, IRI has used the key findings of our She Vote assessment tool and previous civic education projects around the elections to understand the barriers to reaching women, especially rural women, in advance of elections. Understanding the restrictions and movement women can face and how rigid gender roles can lead to uh, decreased participation, CSO partners met with women in spaces to allow for candid conversations around the importance of their vote and the voting process including locations like potato farms, factories, formal dress shops, and other neighborhood gathering places. CSO partners are also using creative methods to help explain and educate uh, voters on the power of their voice, where they used a couscous cooking competition um, to allow participants to vote on the best dish through a process that mirrored the Tunisian voting procedures. Taking lessons learned from this process, IRI has already built various channels and is poised to construct other creative means to reach these groups in order to shift information sharing from elections to current public health discussion in order to ensure that more Tunisians and citizens around the world, including women, are able to protect themselves from the virus with social distancing and hygiene measures, as well as to understand what the government's doing. It's difficult under normal circumstances to reach and engage women in political processes, especially rural women and other marginalized populations. And the current COVID-19 lens emphasizes the importance of being all the more intentional and in making sure these groups have access to information. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Gina from IFAS to talk more about elections. Thanks, Valerie. Um, my name is Gina Chirillo, and I'm the Senior Program Officer for Gender at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFAS. Um, and for those of you who might be a little less familiar with IFAS, um, IFAS works with our local partners around the globe to make sure that democracies deliver for all. And an important and critical piece of this mission is ensuring that election processes are inclusive and credible. Um, and as, you know, as Valerie mentioned, women make up about half the population. And so, you know, our thinking is that if women um, are half the population and cannot meaningfully and equally participate in electoral processes, then these processes aren't truly representative of people. And this is something we need to keep in mind in particular during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk specifically about IFAS's recommendations on how to protect gender equality during elections, focusing on these four key pieces of the electoral process. Um, so the first on the voter registration process, um, it's critical that election management bodies are always collecting gender disaggregated data, but it's even more important now during COVID-19 um, so that they can assess where there might be areas where women are under registering um, so that they can target efforts there to do specific outreach to women and other marginalized groups that might not be able to access the process, in particular in places where active voter registration is required or where in-person registration is required. So collecting gender disaggregated data at the voter registration phase and throughout the electoral process is critical. Um, then moving on to the voter education process, this is also critical during a global pandemic such as this. Um, as we know that information channels might be limited during a global health crisis. So for example, if traditionally election officials and civil society organizations, organizations are reaching women at markets and those markets are closed because of COVID-19, there needs to be there needs to be a thought on how to reach those women um, and to understand how they access uh, voter information. And this is, you know, not only just you know women who we might think about in in city centers, but rural women, um, women who might be illiterate, and women from other marginalized groups. And one way to do this is to engage women civil society organizations and tap into their networks um, to uh, truly understand how women are accessing information. Um, and not only the disinformation strategy of voter education is important, but also the content and um, messages that are sent out. 
Um, so, you know, in a pandemic when individuals are um, required or suggested to stay inside by government institutions, um, this environment could provide an excuse for male members of household, especially in more conservative societies, uh, to prohibit women's participation in elections. And so it's really critical now that voter information messages continue to emphasize the importance of women's political participation um, if women feel safe in doing so. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about women candidates and elected officials. Um, women who participate in politics, and especially women candidates, are often targets of online abuse and hate speech. Um, and these can include, you know, name calling, shaming, threats of physical or sexual violence to them or their family members. And given the fact that pandemic conditions are requiring a lot of, um, you know, our daily lives and things like um, women's campaigns to move online, it's important that um, the issue of online abuse and hate speech is addressed by election officials, political parties, and by international implementers as well. So one example of this is, um, you know, encouraging political parties to include a commitment in their codes of conduct to not use hate speech or online violence as a tactic. Um, Another important piece is that women candidates who might have fewer resources than their male counterparts are um, given the training and the skills on how to run effective online campaigns, which they might not have been familiar with before the global pandemic. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about voter um, operations. So EMBs are moving to make election management bodies are moving to make elections safer uh, for poll workers and voters. And so in doing so, they must keep the unique needs of women voters and women poll workers in mind. So for example, it's important that election management officials, um, when they're um, giving personal protection equipment to um, workers that this PPE properly fits women um, because often PPE is not made to fit women's bodies. Another consideration is that if training for poll workers is moving online, we know that there's a gender gap in access to technology and the internet. So this could exclude some women poll workers from participating virtually. So mitigation should be designed, mitigation measures should be designed with that in mind. Um, in addition, you know, during the quarantine, as Michelle mentioned, women often bear the brunt of childcare and other domestic responsibilities. And so it's important that election management bodies um, provide guidance on um, how to safely bring children to polling stations if parents need to bring children to polling stations um, when they're voting. Um, and also provide guidance that um, individual voters with children be given priority in lines. Um, and then finally, um, if there is an increase in postal absentee or proxy voting, um, this should be coupled with clear guidance to voters um, and also to aware awareness raising efforts to counter family voting, discourage intimidation, and clearly promote voting as a secret individual right. Next slide. So these are kind of some key takeaways. Uh, the first is that any mitigation measures or alternative plans we as international implementers or electoral stakeholders, civil society organizations, et cetera, designed to mitigate the impact or spread of COVID-19 must be designed with the most marginalized in mind. So yes, we're talking about women, but we're also talking about women with disabilities, women from rural areas, illiterate women, et cetera. Um, the second key takeaway is that in the long term, it's critical to address gender inequalities that exacerbate the effects of the pandemic. Um, we kind of see that in times of crisis, inclusion is sometimes thought of as something that, um, you know, like it's not urgent or we don't have time to address this now. But if we ignore it, we're perpetuating um, some existing power structures that got us here in the first place. So it's really critical that we address these ongoing gender inequalities that exist. Um, so IFAS um, is working to, um, with election management officials on all of these topics, and we also have some more guidance um, in our survival guide for democracies on the IFAS website. Next slide. Um, so now we're going to hear a short video from Fauzia Tariq, our senior gender advisor in our IFAS Pakistan office, who's going to give us some more information on how COVID-19 has affected women's political participation in her home country. The COVID-19 pandemic 
has affected women's political participation detrimentally in Pakistan. A gender gap of 12.7 million on voter list is feared to be further exacerbated during the pandemic due to a slow voter registration process. This is particularly the case when male family members deem participation in electoral processes too unsafe for women. For example, in a 2019 survey conducted by Pakistan's Institute of Development and Economic Alternatives, 43.4% of male respondents claimed it was not appropriate to allow women to vote if there were chances of fighting breaking out at the polling station. And this highlights an inherent willingness to impose restrictions on women's voting rights. Similarly, women with disabilities, including those under guardianship or lacking access to independent transportation and assistance, are also at risk of electoral restrictions by family members. To shed light upon another issue, women have alarmingly been underrepresented in matters of COVID-19 decision making. Most committees that have been set up to implement Pakistan's national plan of action on pandemic are largely dominated by men. And of all the ministries and departments, the Human Rights Ministry and Women's Development Department were left out. Additionally, the plan of action on COVID-19 does not take into consideration specific needs of women and most marginalized. In Pakistan, a youth volunteer-based initiative, the Corona Relief Task Force, has been created to assess the civil administration to spread awareness and combat the virus. However, only 2,000 out of these 700,000 volunteers are women, aggregating to a mere 0.2%. Now the question is that what gender-sensitive measures can stakeholders take to mitigate COVID-19's effort on women's political participation? On the primary, boosting women's representation on decision-making bodies to effectively integrate women's practical and strategic needs into response measures. Secondly, the Election Commission of Pakistan should utilize this time of reduced activity to analyze the ways in which planning and preparation for the upcoming elections, whenever they may be held, with careful consideration given to potential COVID transmission, including the safety of poll workers and other election staff. It is critical for these measures to be designed from a gender consideration in mind. Another uh, essential aspect to be dealt with is the local elections. These elections which have been delayed previously on other grounds and currently due to COVID-19 should be proceeded with once mitigation measures are in place. Women continue to be underrepresented and disenfranchised at the local level while elections are put on hold. The COVID-19 pandemic Okay, you can go to the next slide, Siobhan. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Um, we have raced through a lot of information today. I recognize we could literally talk for days about all of the various um, impacts on different groups of women and different um, you know, different marginalized communities within the pandemic, as well as what, you know, what some effective responses um, may be. I think, you know, obviously this is also um, a learning process for all of us. None of us have lived through anything like this before. And I think, you know, our, um, our primary goal today was to emphasize that, um, you know, ac across the board when we're thinking about democracy and governance and um, human rights responses, the absolute um, foundational importance of making sure that whatever area um, or issue we're looking at, we're, we're looking at it through um, an intersectional and an inclusive gender lens. And then I think Caroline and, and Valerie and Gina and Michelle um, did a good job of sort of drilling down and, and providing some illustrative examples of what that may look like moving forward. Um, we have time for some questions. We may not get to all of them, but we're going to try and get through as many as possible. Um, you know, I'd like to start, and I think I will... Um, I will start by directing this to um, Caroline, and then if, if Gina and Valerie um, have uh, additional um, input, please, please feel free to jump in. We talked a lot about increased violence uh, in both the public and private sphere for women, so there were some questions about 
um, can we expect to see an increase in violence against women in politics and in elections in, in this new environment? And if so, what might some of those responses be? Um, and I know that Gina and Carolina Valerie will all have something to say about this. So I'll turn it over first to Carolyn, please. Great, thank you so much. And that's a really important question. Um, of course, at this point in time, we have not been able to start collecting actual data on it. But yes, unfortunately, we do expect to see an increase in violence targeting women in politics in a similar way that we see an increase in violence in the private sphere. Um, we've actually uh, started to adapt current programming that we have that's focused on uh, understanding violence against women in politics and political parties and electoral cycles and so forth um, and trying to adapt it so that we can continue the work online because we know it's going to be so critical. And so thinking about what are the factors that you need to take into consideration if you're doing online violence against women politics programming. A lot of this is about talking to women inside political parties or inside parliaments to understand what type of violence they're experiencing so that we can better uh, identify the, the ways to address it. But if these conversations are happening on a telephone or happening on a computer platform, we need to make sure that privacy issues are considered. You know, a lot of these women will have to have these conversations inside their own homes. And we know that violence against women in politics begins inside a woman's home. The first barrier, um, the, oftentimes the first perpetrator of the violence women experience to control their political activism is from their own male family members. And so these are the considerations that we're, we're taking on and adapting our programming because we do know that there is going to be a likely increase and we have to continue and almost even make more robust our programming to address violence against women in politics or we'll see a backsliding of gains made. Yeah, and I would just add um, something specifically about um, online violence and harassment um, against women who participate in politics. So, you know, we know that online violence has always been an issue, um, but obviously the fact that the internet and online spaces are being used more now um, makes it even more important to address um, because online violence, not only in, in public online spaces, not only affects you know the woman who it's targeted at, but other women see this, and then it sends the message to all women that politics isn't a space for them, or they're not welcome in that space. And that's another reason why it's really critical that we address you know this kind of violence. Um, so you know, one way ICUS has been adapting a little bit is using um, our existing kind of communications channels and networks that we use for voter education and voter information um, to disseminate messages meant to counter um, both violence in, in the physical world and in the online in online spaces so we've tried to kind of make sure our messaging um, has been about you know combating this important issue and I would just add um, briefly that I think as we think about adaptations to our programming um, sometimes we assume that everyone has a working knowledge of how to stay safe online and protect their um, data and information. And so I think that's been something that uh, we've just been adding in as a fundamental core part of all of our programming to do digital security training to make sure um, we're not operating that that's an assumption from our partners. Great, thank you. Um, and this I'm going to open up to um, to all of the panelists. Um, we have an interesting uh, series of questions around what can we learn from global women leaders who have responded effectively um, to the, the pandemic and how do we harness this effective um, leadership to shift the discourse around women as leaders and women's leadership um, potential and possibility more broadly. I guess I'll jump in and start here, but I think we're seeing really strong and effective leadership from women who are in executive positions in their country. I think New Zealand and Germany are great examples. Um, and so I think talking about them and uh, really highlighting that and the results that they're seeing is really important in shifting the conversation around why it matters that we think about gender and spaces for um, women and other marginalized voices in um, political participation. So. I think this is really exciting um, and definitely a bright spot in a lot of the news that we're um, being overwhelmed with these days. And I think it's a great point to start em emphasizing why gender is such an important conversation um, in light of the DRG response to COVID-19. Great, 
Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and I agree with everything Valerie said. I think that it's about the type of leadership that's needed to actually address something like a health pandemic. We need to be leading in a way that is building trust, is building cohesion among populations, um, is empathetic. I don't think it's, women are born this way as leaders. Um, I don't think it's essentialized, but I do think that we're seeing all the women leaders leading in a way that's necessary to actually address this pandemic. And I think, you know, historically, masculine identity of strong man, the strong man political leaders, um, the, the militarized male political leader has been seen as a successful way to lead and almost has been um, synonymous with political leader. And what we're seeing is the difference between the strong man leaders and their ability to be successful uh, and build trust, right? Because the, the community needs to trust their government. And the military strong man leader who's telling you what to do and telling you how it is as opposed to listening and really responding in an inclusive way, it's not working as well as, as how a lot of the women are leading in this situation. And I think it's fantastic because it's not just about increasing women's leadership, it's about changing the way leadership is done and changing the characteristics of what's considered a good leader. Yes, I, I think that is very well put from both of you. And the only thing I want to add is that it's not only important to, to see that, you know, women leaders have been um, sometimes more effective and kind of being proactive about um, these mitigating measures around the pandemic, but also looking at kind of the types of policies that women leaders have been um, instituting in that they tend to be more um, gender sensitive and sensitive to women's needs. So I think that's also an important thing to highlight as well. Thank you. Um, I would like to pose the question to Gina about what specific issues um, do you think that EMBs need to be thinking about and responding to moving forward? Yeah, so I think um, some of the key um, issues that EMBs should be responding to, first and foremost, is that a lot of EMBs election management bodies are um, designing quickly uh, mitigation plans around specific elections that are upcoming. So they're trying to figure out what to do, how to hold elections safely and securely, which is really important. Um, but you know, even though this needs to happen quickly, and we all recognize this, these policies and procedures need to be designed from a gender sensitive lens. So as much as possible, election management bodies should be working with civil society organizations that focus on women's needs, um, you know, soliciting input from, from women voters, from a diversity of women, to ensure that kind of the new plans and procedures they, they put in place aren't disproportionately negatively affecting women. So I think kind of at the top level, that's the core of what, you know, election officials need to do. Um, and I think their, you know, election uh, management bodies need to focus a lot of their voter education, as I mentioned, on encouraging, um, continuing to encourage women's equal participation, because I do think this unfortunately might be an opportunity for those who maybe aren't as friendly to women's participation. It might give those people an opportunity to prohibit it or, or kind of, you know, tamp down on it. And, and I think that that could be a negative effect that we see. So making sure that, you know, any kind of election operations programming is accessible to all people and then continuing to message about the importance of women's political participation, I think is key. You know, shifting a little bit and thinking more about political parties, um, I would ask Valerie and or Caroline to respond. We, there, there are a few questions around political parties and thinking about um, how, how to respond to parties and others who are, who may be trying to exploit the shrinking political space to further restrict women's political participation. Um, and also thinking about responses to um, the fact that, you know, amidst the economic crisis that is accompanying the health crisis, um, you know, might we foresee increased um, instances of, you know, vote buying and, and, and that sort of thing? And, and how do we respond to that? And particularly thinking about the ways in which women and other marginalized communities are uh, particularly vulnerable to some of those sorts of maneuvers. Oh, hold on, Caroline, you're muted. I was going to okay. let Valerie go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who'd ever like to go first? There's, there's a lot in there. <laughs> go ahead, Valerie. 
Well, first of all, I think that's a great question. Um, I think this is really an opportunity for political parties to see um, a chance to engage more um, of the voter base and make sure that they're building a broad swath of support that is going to be very necessary as voters are assessing how their political leaders are responding to uh, the pandemic and what they want the world to look like after this. And so I think that now is a critical time for us to be emphasizing the importance of bringing more women's voices into their party leadership structures and that their platforms are really reflective of um, being responsive to what we're seeing as some of these challenges that women in their communities are facing. Um, and those political parties are gonna be the ones that are successful. Um, I also do think that you know, with, everything, with every opportunity, there's challenges and I, I think that we will see increased um, attempts you know, for vote buying or other corruption, but I think the parties that are really gonna succeed in the long term are the ones that are really going to see this as an opportunity um, to build support with the entire community and those marginalized voices that are being um, disproportionately impacted. Great, thank you, Valerie. I agree with everything Valerie said. And I would just add that I think we can learn a lot from the work we've done with political parties and other political leaders during times of transition from conflict to democracy um, and peace or from authoritarian regimes to peace. Uh, because it's very similar in the sense that, as I said in my question number three, we need to seize this opportunity of transformation to not just transition back to where we were before, but to really transform pre-existing inequities. And so there is an opening right now. And um, two key things that we need to keep in mind is don't forget about the autonomous women's movements. Don't forget about civil society. We know that women are on the front lines of advocacy. Um, they are 70% of the front lines of direct service, but they're also out there advocating for, for needs. And we need to make sure that we continue to financially support those women so that when we move into recovery, their voices are ready, they have their priorities set, and they, and they can come together and really push for change because political parties aren't gonna necessarily adopt gender progressive mechanisms without that pressure from the outside. And then at the same time, we need to be working with the parties at this time to help them think about how do they transform their institutional rules and processes to allow for greater women's leadership? How do we build the autonomous women's groups inside the parties themselves, really support the women's wings and the women's voices? And how do we make sure that at a time like this where women in the parties are likely stuck in their home, have less access to leadership and less ability to push for change, they can still continue to advocate from where they are at inside their homes to the party leadership that oftentimes is getting together behind closed doors or on the phone and not, not including women at all. Thank you both and thank you Caroline for, for mentioning the, the idea about adequately resourcing and investing in local women's organizations. Uh, a few questions came came through on that topic and, and certainly um, whatever democracy and governance issue we're looking at, it is of critical importance to make sure that we are simultaneously maintaining um, that focus on both, you know, women's wings and other sort of affinity groups within parties, as well as um, within civil society um, more broadly and make sure that you know, pre, during, and post pandemic, where we are adequately resourcing and building the capacities of those groups so that they are um, ready to spring into action when, when, the, when there is a space there for them to, to take advantage of. I do want to note that we are at three o'clock um, if people need to leave the meeting, um, but I'm going to take a few more questions if that's okay with the panelists. So we'll continue for a few more minutes. Um, I wanted to raise the question that came up about um, how do we how do we target men to change attitudes um, towards women in thinking about um, women's political participation and electoral participation um, specifically? And I think there there was some question about how, what are some effective ways to do this broadly, but particularly in light of this global health crisis, um, what, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about and doing and, and implementing as good practices? And I'll open that up to anyone who wants to respond. Sure. Um, so I'll start um, by talking a little bit about the work that IFAS has done working with and engaging male allies um, in the past. So, um, you know, we 
though, though it's important, of course, to build like women's individual capacity to participate in politics, it's also critical to create an enabling environment for women to participate. And so, you know, engaging male allies is a, is a key piece of this. And so IFAS has designed a curriculum that, um, alongside that can be run alongside a women's leadership training, for example, um, with uh, male participants um, to kind of talk about why gender equality and women's political participation is important, to teach a little bit about unconscious bias and power and privilege, um, about diversity and intersectionality issues, um, et cetera. And, you know, we're continuing to run this programming in, in the Current pandemic, transitioning it to online sessions as possible. We're doing this in Sri Lanka, for example. And um, one key piece we've modified a little bit um, because of the pandemic is we've put increased emphasis on our, um, you know, specific module on male allies online. So how men can be allies to women who are experiencing online violence and harassment and what to do in those kinds of cases. Um, because, you know, as we mentioned, online violence will likely increase during the pandemic and become more of an issue. Um, so that's way, one way we've kind of adapted it um, in order to engage men in, in the fight for gender equality. Um, I can um, talk to this as well. So, uh, you know, we look at this through a similarly three lenses. There's going to be institutional changes and, uh, you know, getting rid of, let's say, formal electoral processes, for example, or canceling elections altogether might be an institutional barrier. And then there's obviously the capacity of women to continue to participate and to advocate at these times. But underlying everything are the sociocultural norms that are oftentimes at the base of women's lack of power and men's desire and ability to maintain it. So I think any intervention we're doing right now needs to include uh, addressing uh, sociocultural norms and male masculine gender norms um, and to work directly with male political leaders to help them understand why it's important for democracy to be equitable, why it's important for women to be included at this time and to really get their buy-in. Um, and the National Democratic Institute has been working to build a toolkit and an approach for working with male uh, political leaders. For the last year, we've run a pilot in the Democratic Republic of Congo, working with male political party leaders and have really seen a shift in their commitment to gender equality and a really a change sort of in how they view democracy. And so I think you have to integrate this into anything that you're doing right now because men can commit to including women and they can say verbally or strategically that they want women to be a part of this process, but until they really and truly are committed to gender equality, we oftentimes don't see these changes. And so I think it has to be a part of everything that we do. Um, I would just add, I think Caroline really summed up how IRI is looking at this, that really looking at engaging uh, men and boys in all of our programming is critical. I think Gina highlighted a really great program they're doing to train um, men alongside the women that they're working with. And so, and it's also talking about better outcomes, inclusivity, leads to better outcomes because you're factoring in the whole of the population that you're working um, to engage. And so I think that that's really a common sense argument. The research is proving that whether it's, um, you know, the economic um, results that you get when it truly is reflective of the population you're serving. So I think this is a real opportunity to continue to amplify um, the, the possibility to achieve better outcomes. Thank you. I'm going to um, I'm going to put two more questions forward before we wrap up. The first um, I, is is a big question, and I'm sure is on many people's minds. Um, how do we mitigate the digital gender divide in a moment where so much of the DRG programming that we're all focusing on is moving online? What what are some of the things that we can do? I would just um, jump in initially to highlight IRI is looking at this challenge as we are, you know, adapting our programming to a virtual setting um, while we go through social distancing. Um, and I think it's sometimes important to look at not only the high tech, but also low tech engagement. Um, you know, a lot of people are listening to the radio for their news or engaging in other more localized forms of communication, whether it's their cell phones or things like that. So I think there's an opportunity to get creative and really contextualize your approach to the community and the beneficiaries you're looking to reach. But 
Um, while that is a challenge, there's ways around it. Yeah, and I'd also say that um, one, of, one example of one of those low tech kind of options is using SMS text messaging um, as an option. I think when we tend to think about technology, we think of, you know, video calls or, you know, something more high tech that requires internet access, but sometimes just using SMS or texting can um, be partially a solution. Obviously, it doesn't mitigate the barriers of women who don't even act, have access to cell phones, so that that is always a challenge. Um, but really, you know, doing surveys or working with women women's organizations to understand how women are accessing information now is really key and different types of women how they're accessing information is really important in order to be able to design those types of programs. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said so far. So I think we have to recognize and admit that in, in regions like sub-Saharan Africa, more than half the female population or half the population does not have access to their own phone, let alone their computer. Um, we need to take, uh, as I mentioned earlier, issues about privacy and security into consideration if we're communicating with them through these tools that they don't actually own. Um, we are developing a technology assessment. We think that anytime and uh, now as we adapt programming, and I'll give an example, I had a conversation with our Mali team, Mali uh, team the other day, talking about how can we continue to do the to the work with women and you know my first question was you know how many women have access to a telephone how many women have access to a computer are women literate can they use these tools is it safe for them to use these tools the first thing that has to be done is this type of assessment because it's going to vary by country but again you know technology for some people may be a phone tree um, and technology for other people you know can be i did yesterday i led an online training for women in kosovo on violence against women in politics it was interactive it was fantastic but i'm not going to be able to do that with women in sub-saharan africa necessarily so i think these are important questions that we continue to grapple with and we don't necessarily know all the answers to yet okay and the final question we're going to have time for today um, i will pose to all of the panelists and this is around um, in, in a moment where we're seeing, um, you know, increasing extraordinary measures, quarantine, states of emergency, martial law in some places, et cetera, as practitioners, how do we better ensure that these extraordinary measures are not restricting um, access to services for women and other, other marginalized groups? Um, and how do we make sure that we are um, preserving and helping to, um, to sort of reopen and keep open um, pu public space and public life for, for women in particular? So I can try and answer that question. And I mean, I think the question in and of itself is the question that needs to be asked, right? What we're talking about is increased insecurity, whether real, because as in the case of Kenya, there's actually a very militarized police response. Women are actually in danger. If they go out to advocate or if they go out to participate in some way in public spaces, they are physically in danger. We know at times of increased insecurity and violence, women tend to self isolate and not participate and their participation decreases. So we need to be asking the question, if the context is becoming more violent, which is likely to happen in a time of crisis, um, and this might also be because of rioting as, what was, as we're seeing in, in India and other contexts, what can we do to support women to continue to participate um, in, in response to this um, violent environment and recognize that there is gonna be an increase in violence and that we know that this causes a decrease in women's participation. And I think some of the ways to deal with this are about dealing with the election management bodies. They're about dealing with the, the parliament. They're about dealing with the formal mechanisms and processes that are being put into place in order to continue political processes in general take into consideration how do we ensure women participate when it's not safe for them necessarily to be out on the street or to be transferring you know, themselves from their home to the parliament and also not as safe for them to be participating online. I think Gina's point about online violence against women in politics is extremely important because it's going to increase. And if we're saying that that's the space where political decision-making is happening, we need to be paying attention to that as well. And I would just agree with Caroline. I think it's really important that we're highlighting the disproportionate way that the pandemic is impacting women and within that other marginalized voices. 
Um, I think that that's really important for policymakers to understand that the policies they're putting forward have very different effects on the population as a whole. And so then I, I would just also um, say that I think it's important to utilize networks and highlight how women can stay connected um, uh, to one another despite the challenges that we're seeing um, with lockdowns or stay at home orders or that type of thing um, to just share information and be able to um, access different entry points uh, for the needs that they have. And I'll just add something quickly, kind of reflective of, of Valerie's point on gender sensitive policymaking and understanding how women are affected differently by these extraordinary measures um, and kind of the rising potential um, authoritarianism that might be coming out of this is making sure that women are at the table. Um, on these pandemic committees, you know, my colleague Fauzia from Pakistan highlighted, you know, how women are being left out of these decision-making bodies. And we know that when women are part of these decision-making bodies, more gender-sensitive policies come out of them. And because a lot of them are seconded from, you know, elected officials or committees that already exist that are already exclude women, that kind of exclusion is just perpetuated on these um, pandemic-specific committees. So making sure that women are at the table and women are at decision-making positions is really critical as well. Thank you all. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, to close, I'd like to bring it back to something that Michelle opened with when she said, you know, we need to think about what does this look like when this is over? Um, we know that nothing is going to look the same, um, but it doesn't have to look worse for women and for other marginalized communities. And I think, um, you know, as we've tried to highlight today, one of the keys to making sure that things don't look worse and potentially look better is as we're thinking through our DRG responses to this, this global pandemic, to make sure that we are being deliberate and being very intentional about integrating that inclusive and intersectional gender approach to not only preserve the, the gains that we've made, but in fact to, to potentially um, create more, uh, more inclusive and more resilient um, uh, democratic institutions moving forward. And so with that, I thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, the recording of the conversation will be available um, and we'll also be sending around the PowerPoint to everybody. Um, we hope to continue these sorts of conversations um, in the future. I um, hope this was useful and wish everybody um, much luck in your work in this area moving forward. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.